Welcome to Animal Park. I'm Kate Humble. And I'm Ben Fogel. And behind us is Lord Bath's rather impressive stately home. Built in the 16th century, it has over 100 rooms. And we'll be going behind the scenes just a little later, as well as catching up with some of the 400 animals that live in the safari park. Coming up on today's programme... Just how much monkey business will the buffaloes put up with? We're adding spice to the life of the tigers, but do they really like curry? And after nearly 450 years, is Longleat House finally collapsing? Some of the uh, decoration is actually falling from the ceiling. And obviously, we need it to be safe for people to walk through. But we'll start down at Half Mile Lake, where keeper Mark Ty is worried that some of the seven Californian sea lions appear to be losing weight. They catch some wild fish in the lake, but they're also fed every day with mackerel. Even though they appear to be eating normally, Mark has called in Safari Park vet Duncan Williams to take a look. All these five females here are eating basically a bull's ration. Yeah. And as you, I mean, you look at coral and ebony particularly, I mean, I know they're always skinnier than ours, but... And old in any way, have they? You'd think at seven and a half kilos, that would be more than enough. Mark's particularly concerned about Lindy, even though she's always first in the queue for lunch. Well, Lindy down here has got uh, a very crusty face. Uh, it's, so it's like she's got some sort of abscess in here that's weeping, and it's all sort of running down the side of her face, and she just look, doesn't seem to impede her eating at all. Um, but she is looking very sort of messy and uncomfortable around the mouth. Well, my big concern is the fish quality is not um, really good enough, and I, I think it possibly it's been stored for for too long because of the storage, the quality re reduces, and a bit of the, the, the vitamins are not not there anymore. Lindy was born in the lake and has worked her way up the female hierarchy. Within the group, she's pretty much top dog now. Um, you know, Ozzy's sort of over the hill now, if you like, and in her sort of twilight years, and she can't be bothered with it all now. So Lindy is the, sort of the dominant sea lion in the lake. Lindy has been an excellent mother, always is. Um, you know, she's one of those real strong characters who's an old hand at having babies. She, you know, she just gets on, gives birth, no fuss. Um, looks after them and leaves them alone very quickly. Some of the other mums are pretty sort of neurotic about their pups and they, they just won't leave them alone at all and they sort of faff and mess about with them and actually cause more problems. Last year saw a record number of sea lion births with six pups born within days of each other, including Lindy's baby Lola. The sea lion colony, or splash, to use the correct word, is popular with keepers like Darren Beasley, as well as the public. You've got a huge great lake, you have ducks and seagulls, you have real fish, you know, bits of driftwood, we've got boats. You see these guys, they will actually ride the bow waves. You know, the, the boats push them along, they're like dolphins. Um, they interact with each other fantastically, you know. And when you think... Ozzy, now our oldest, she's 26 years old, born and bred here 26 years ago. Um, and every, every day of her life, she swims in this lake, you know, up and down. It's got to be something to say to her. Lots of exercise. Lots of exercise. Nice oily food, oily fish. Fresh air. Oh, you know, you can live to 110 down here, can you? <laughs> The average life expectancy of a sea lion in the wild is about 15, but in captivity it can be twice that. 
So at just 18, Lindy isn't old. But Mark is increasingly worried about her health, and a delivery of first-class fresh fish doesn't seem to have made any difference. Well, Lindy's actually not improved at all. She's still got this kind of discharge coming down the side of her face. Um, and it's a bit of a sort of mystery as to what's going on. Sea lions are really hard to treat. Um, they've got to be eating because the biggest, the only, about the only way to get any medication into them is through their food. You know, if you can put the medication in their food, fine. Otherwise, it means darting, injecting. Injecting's pretty much a no-no. It's a difficult dilemma. Sedating sea lions can make them hold their breath as though they were about to dive. If you give them too much sedative, they never start breathing again. But it's extremely difficult to gauge the correct dose. The keepers will try every other way of diagnosing Lindy's illness before they'll consider sedation. Never seen anything like this in, you know, the sea lions we've had, and particularly not Lindy. She's always kind of been one of those um, sort of, if you like, bulletproof sea lions that's never had any problems. She just sort of takes everything in her stride. So it's a bit of a worry. We'll come back to see whether they can find a way to help Lindy. The way in which different species get along together in the safari park can provide some fascinating insights into animal behaviour. But it can also be hard to see what's going on at close quarters. So last year, Kate conducted a little experiment into some truly remarkable behaviour up in Monkey Jungle with head of section Tim Yeo. We've set up a tiny camera, a mini camera, in the feeding hut where the buffaloes eat. And we're just seeing now, we're sitting here like we're doing a kind of spy operation, watching the buffaloes have got fantastic shots. Now, Tim has seen the monkeys playing on the buffaloes. I never have. I'm not sure I believe him. So um, what we're hoping to do is get evidence of this. And actually, Tim, look, there are monkeys appearing, definitely. They're oh, coming okay. closer, yes, aren't they? Yes, coming in. And does it tend to be feeding time? Do they sort of take advantage of the fact that the buffaloes are sort of distracted by food and think they can sort of sneak up and have a play? Well, I think, really, I mean, I think that the, the, the monkey probably used the, the buffalo as a platform, really, just to sit and... Uh... So it's just a glorified tree trunk for them. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Here we are, look, Kate, now oh, we've look, got one look, on... Look, there is one on, sitting on... ...on the back there. Look, there oh, we are. That's absolutely look, amazing, really, using yeah. it as a springboard. Yeah, yeah. <gasps> exactly yeah. As, the, as, the, as they'd behave on a tree trunk. There's another one, actually, oh, look, there <laughs> is... again, on, Isn't on the back. Isn't that amazing? Wee! Just it just jumped. It's this huge <laughs> jump from one to the other. Completely fearless. And as you say, the buffs are just sort of carrying <laughs> on, eating. This is hilarious. I've never seen anything like it. Picture, but... Oh, we have lost a picture. What's happened? Do you think someone's trodden they've on it? They've or... disconnected the... Our, the monkeys have got the... Uh, can we, can we open the door, Tim? Yeah, sure, <laughs> sure. Let's see if we can get that. No, she's she pulling us. Well, I think, I think we're going to have to stop now, because the monkeys have basically <laughs> just destroyed the whole experiment. <laughs> you are cheeky monkeys. Put that down. <laughs> Well, to ensure we don't lose any more equipment, we've decided to enlist the help of Keeper Julie Scott. Hi, Hi Julie. Yeah. Now, I know that you spend your entire day in I Monkey do, yeah. Jungle with the monkeys, so you must see some pretty unusual behaviour in there. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Was, is there anything that comes to mind that makes you laugh or that you've been surprised about in particular? Uh, when the monkeys are swinging on the buffalo. <laughs> really? the best bit, yeah. Do they hang on the horns and everything? Yeah, on the climbing up the tail, do everything, they? yeah. Well, I tell you what, we've brought this little camera along. Yeah. So um, do you think that while you're sat in your, in your little truck in there, you could, um, you could try and actually film some of the behaviour yeah. that you observe? Well, um, okay. we'll give you that, and, um, and best of luck. Thank you. And you can join us later in the programme when hopefully we'll have a sneaky glimpse of the monkeys at play. Lady, come on. Back down at Half Mile Lake, keeper Michelle Stevens is trying to coax Lindy onto dry land so they can take a closer look at her. Despite a course of antibiotics, her sore mouth seems to be getting worse and she's stopped eating. She's just not herself, not her usual self. She's normally up to mischief. You know, she's quite adventurous. All she wants to do now is just get out and, you know, get away. She's not interested in eating at all. Yeah, we're trying to catch her, and then when we do get her caught, call the vet out, and then he'll come out immediately and, and see what he can do. Sea lions are pretty good at hiding if they're sick. Um, we have a feeling 
the hole in the mouth has probably been, you know, eroding away sort of, you know, for quite some time. Um, and the other sea lions will just treat it as normal because she'll just hide the fact. You know, in the wild they're a prey animal, they'll hide any illness and make out they're stronger. Obviously, if, they're, if they look like they're weak, they get picked off in the wild, so. Two days of patient observation finally pay off when keeper Luke Priddle sees Lindy come ashore. Well, last night when we come down to feed her, I come in to feed her and she was swimming around. And I opened up this gate and this gate and pulled everything into the other side and she just come up and had a look. So I ran past her and shut both gates up and she was cool. Now at least they can get a good look at Lindy, although she'd bite anyone who tried to examine her mouth. Unfortunately, the keepers have run out of options and she'll have to be sedated despite the risks. Sea lions often hold their breath and under sedation, it's impossible to tell whether they've stopped breathing altogether. Deputy Head Warden Ian Turner will dart Lindy, but he knows the danger. The two worst animals to sedate is giraffes and sea lions. And sea lions is probably one of the worst ones um, because the breathing just goes so funny, they stop. Um, Duncan's going to try a different drug this time to see how we get on, so hopefully, fingers crossed, um, that'll be fine. But it's all, this is probably one of the, of all the animals you don't want to date, it's probably sea lions. So this is a, yeah, a bit of a tense time. But it's got to be done because of the state she's in. She's in such a state now that if we don't do anything, she's going to die anyhow. So we need to have a look. But it could already be too late. If Lindy's condition can't be treated, she'll have to be put to sleep. We'll come back to find out what happens. Variety is the spice of life, and the big cat keepers are always coming up with ways to enrich the lives of the animals in their care. The idea is to make their lives more interesting by stimulating their senses, and keeper Bob Trollope has invited Kate and I up to the tiger enclosure to help him and Naomi Rayford with his latest wheeze. So tell us a little bit about this unusual enrichment exercise. Well, it's a smell enrichment we're doing right. today. And me and Ben are going to be dealing with the spices. Right. And you're going to be dealing with that lot. Ah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Looks charming. You. Lucky you. <laughs> so, Bob, this is, this is the sort of stuff, is this? We've, what yeah, have we got here? We've got this. I recognise that. That's ginger. That's ginger. And what have you got we've in your got hand? some cloves in my hand here. And, and that is cinnamon sticks. OK. And these have all kind of been ground down into these pastes, have they? Like yeah, in here? Yeah, we, we've ground them into a paste so it's easier to smell about. And with the cloves, we can scatter them around. Okay, see if I recognise. I think that's ginger. Is that that's right? Yeah, that's right. Yep, Excellent. Yep. Well, should we get spreading? Yeah, we're going to do that. Right. We'll leave you to the poo. <laughs> Thanks very much. Isn't that just typical? Yeah. <laughs> so we've got a bucket here and a couple of sacks. What, so what are we actually doing? Yeah. We've got a bucket here of fresh rhino poo. Yeah, and that's exactly what's in the sacks. But we've left these overnight so the scent can soak well into the sacks. Right. And when we drag them, the, the scent will be left oh, on so the So we've road. got to go and drag them around. We do, we? yeah. OK, so shall I take this one? Yep. Feel right. free. And um, so the idea is, is we're sort of leaving, like, a scent trail almost for the tigers. Yeah, we're going to leave a scent trail on the ground so they can pick it up at, at some point in the day to give them some new sniffs. Do, is it a little bit like um, if you're, I don't know, walking a dog and um, a dog will pick up a scent of a rabbit that's gone past? I mean, is that a similar thing? Does it sort of make the tigers kind of be very alert to the, their environment. Yeah, it's because it would be an unusual smell for them in their territory. In the, in the wild, obviously, they would come across rhino dung. Right. But um, So in their territory, it would be a different smell for them. So, yeah, they'd come and sniff, obviously try and be interested in it, pull a, pull a face and then maybe scent on the top to cover oh, their really? own territory again. Oh, really? So yeah. they'd kind of see it almost not as a threat, but of, oh, there's been something wandering around in here. I want to kind of yeah. reinstate myself as the most important animal in yeah. here. Give, give them a smell to cover over so they can remark their territory and see if they follow the scent. And... It's going to be really interesting. I can't wait to see how it they react. It will be, yeah. So we need to carry on dragging this up a, a little up, bit. Up and round the road. Yeah. OK, we're going to be carrying on here. Ben, how are you getting on there? Not too badly. Come, and, come over here and um, see how we're getting on with um, all of these spices here. Um, rather a messy job, but I think slightly more pleasant than the, um, the poo spreading over there. <laughs> Bob, <laughs> Bob, I've got the ginger here. Um, yeah. So basically, we're just spreading it in the tree, aren't we? Yeah, just smearing it on the, the bark. Right. Um, this is about the height that they would sniff it anyway. Right. And, um, of course, they use the trees as scent posts, and this is a classic 
sort of thing that they would come up across. They've got a new smell, they would pass it over the, the, the glands in their uh, mouth. Right. Um, the Jacobson's organs mm -hmm. and uh, all the capillaries on their tongues that will take away the message. You know, for all sense and purposes, this could be a new animal into the territory. Right. Which they could hunt. Obviously, the tigers here were born in captivity, so they'll yeah. never have come across these no. spices before, and will this they? This is why we actually do it, you know, just to give them something new every day. Yeah. You know, it's not a job that we would do every day because otherwise they get used to it. Yeah, of course. So every now and again we just bring in a different smell for a different sort of reaction, I suppose. Well, I can't wait to see what their reaction is to our mix of, um, of spices. And join us later in the programme when Kate and I will find out what they make of it. Longleat House has been in daily use for over 450 years now, and never more so than today as a major tourist attraction. Considering its age, the house is in remarkably good condition, but it's increasingly difficult for house steward Ken Winders to keep it that way. We've had a record year of visitors this year, actually. It's, it's been good news. Um, we've had something like three, between two and three and a half thousand people a day. Uh, that's just within the house. Um, it's good news, obviously, because we need people to come to, for the upkeep of the house, etc. But it's also got its downside as far as the house is concerned, um, because it does cause a certain amount of damage. This is Italian carved marble. The house is open to visitors every day of the year except for Christmas, and guides are always on hand to tell the story of its long and colourful history. If you worked in the court of Henry VIII, you didn't acquire just a few acres of land. But the, time this but the sheer number of visitors can cause irreparable damage. So last winter, Ken initiated a major programme of renovation to prevent any further deterioration. It, it certainly is a headache. I mean, you can see in, in this particular room, um, we're trying to overcome some of the problems uh, of our eight fragments, like the relative humidity within the rooms. Um, this room is um, directly above places like the toilets and, and things like this. It's, it's got direct access to the outside. So therefore the, the humidity in here is always very high. Okay? Which means, it, you know, sometimes it's nearly as wet inside as it is outside. The uh, amount of moisture in the air in this room is, is not good for the furniture, tapestries, etc., etc. Now we come to the estate rooms of Longleat House. Many of the furnishings are very valuable. Some of the 24 chairs in the state dining room date from the reign of King George I, so they're nearly 300 years old. And this is where the Thin family would have entertained nobility, royalty. Um, in fact, the whole of the floor of this house would have been used for that occasion because we go from the state dining room into the saloon, then the state drawing room, and then into the state bedrooms as well. But now, with so many visitors walking by on a daily basis, the chairs have started to fall to pieces. A lot of these knees, what we call knees here, um, they, were, they, were, you know, they were literally falling off daily. I mean, I was getting handfuls given to me by the cleaners. Again, a lot of it was um, with visitors actually you know, moving up against them, touching them, kicking the legs, you know, children running in amongst them and all this sort of business. The first stage was for the major damage to be repaired. Ken called in the furniture consultants to the National Trust and, as well as the superficial damage, Robin Merrifield even found a broken leg. When we get a really serious repair like this, we clean up all the old glue, take out the screws and uh, re-glue it in the right positions and consolidate where the breaks are. Once the damaged legs have been rebuilt, the next stage is to apply size, which seals the wood and acts as a weak glue to hold the paper-thin gold leaf. Annabelle Giltsoff started gilding ten years ago for her antiques business. This is the gold, the gold leaf. It comes in a book of 25 sheets. You lay it onto the pad. You mustn't touch the gold leaf because it's, it's attracted by moisture. So obviously if you touch it, um, it sticks to you. This is a gilder's knife. You've got to keep it sh sharpish, but importantly clean and dry. Otherwise the gold sticks to that too. 
And then I need to use, this is um, water size. And you just wet the area you want to put the gold onto. It's very simple when you've got the knack. <laughs> When the new gold leaf is dry, it has to be distressed slightly to match in with the old gold, and it takes Annabelle about a week to renovate six chairs. But apart from the damage to furnishings, the sheer number of visitors causes wear and tear to the house itself. Up to three and a half thousand pairs of feet a day put enormous strain on floors and the ceilings beneath them. And Ken is worried that the ceiling in the lower dining room may collapse. We'll come back to see what happens. Earlier, Ben and I were in the tiger enclosure helping keeper Bob Trollope put some interesting smells out for the tigers. And Bob, the tigers are about to be let out now. Yeah, we're just about to open the door now. Okay, do you want to go ahead and do yeah. that? Okay. And we'll see how they react. Okay. What do you think they're going to go for first? That's what I want to know. I, my hat, even though I was wearing gloves, I can still smell the yeah. scent of ginger on, on oh, my hands. I would have thought. Uh, they would go for the, the rhino poo first because it's low onto the ground. The first thing they normally do is have a sniff a bit outside and see what's been around throughout mm -hmm. the night or whatever. There's no danger that they're going to think... Oh, look, here. here. Oh, this? Coming out? Oh. oh, this is Sona. Sona. Which is Sona. Just wait for... Do they wait for one another? He tends to wait for the kadu to come oh, out. Oh, look, there they are. Yeah, there she is. Now, they're, they're not going to be sort of... Well, for want of a better expression, freaked out. They're not going to, to kind of feel nervous suddenly smelling uh, something like rhino dung in their enclosure. No, I, I should imagine they would be um, interested in it because yeah. of the fact that it's a new smell and yeah. potential there could be prey out here for them. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, that that's is all. where That's where we started. We started the from, yeah. trail of the, well, uh, you the can rhino dung. She's got her nose lifting her nose up slightly, and that's just getting there's something coming wafting uh, uh, over. Yeah, now, that yeah, yeah. there's the tree yeah. that we, we put the paste on, some of yeah. the different pastes. Oh, she's more she's interested in our land <laughs> over, I think. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Do you think we are a bit of a distraction for No, them? it's most likely, cos you know, they, they, they come out normally and walk round and have a... over scent the, the previous day's scent in. Right. And the fact that there's a land over parked here... Yeah. ..is obviously slightly different something. to what is normal. Well, I mean, how, how much do tigers use scent in, in marking territories and, and sort of letting each, sort of communicating with each other? It is very important, the scent. Um, they use, mainly use their eyesight for hunting, obviously, but scent is for passing messages on whether there's other animals in the territory that they shouldn't be... Uh, I'll just keep my eye on her because she's yes. near us. Um, she would just be checking for different tigers and just see if there's any, any problems within the territory. But, you know, it's and, do they, and, and each morning, will they literally pace the entire enclosure here, just checking who's been around, literally yeah. reading, reading the, the different scents in the air? I most probably can smell the, the spices, yeah. because yeah. it's higher up the tree mm -hmm. and it's... And the wind is sort of, do you think across, the wind is yeah. just, just going in that direction? It's very, the, yeah, the it nose, is. You can definitely see the nose yeah. lifting yeah. up. But what's interesting is that they've both had a sniff and then kind of thought, hmm, mm. I'm not going to go in that area yeah. yet. Maybe our spices are a little bit too strong for them. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they just don't like curry. <laughs> yeah, this is it. Really are absolutely magnificent. Aren't they? Just, it's... The one thing is, though, as well, you know, that's there for the day. It's not going to just exactly. fade away straight away. Yeah. So they must probably pick it up as and when. Yeah. Probably when we're gone. When and, we're um, gone, and they yeah. have a place to themselves yeah. and they can do it in their own time. Well, handily, I do have, Bob... Because we did anticipate <laughs> yes. that they may not react immediately. Yeah. So, I'm afraid we're going to ask you a big favour. We've got a little camera here. Yeah. Um, if you're going to be out in the enclosure today, can you see if you can get anything yeah. on okay. film? And um, we'll come back and see what you've managed to get later on. Yeah, that'd be fine. There you go. Oh, we shall leave that in your charge. Absolutely. Yeah. Hopefully we'll have spiced up their lives. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very good. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Thank you. Longlead's famous miniature railway is one of the park's most popular attractions and has carried six million passengers over the past 30 years. 
But the railway wouldn't be what it is today without the hard work and dedication of John Hayton. I started off on the railway. Um, father was on the railway. Two brothers at Carlisle, the Hayton brothers. Everyone will know them. It was just a, a railway family. Then I moved down to the West Country and this little job came up and I thought, well, all right, I'll try it for five or six years, see what happens, make a mark, move on. And here I am 30 years later. We had to start from scratch virtually and redo it. Locos, wagons, coaches, signals, virtually everything you see were handmade. The railway has been graced by some superb engines and rolling stock over the years, but John still harboured a secret dream. About two years ago, a uh, general manager said, is there anything you really want? I said, yeah, a new steam engine. Tongue-in-cheek, didn't expect it. Um, OK, he said. Wow, right, OK, right, off we go. The brand new steam engine was hand built by Exmoor Steam Railways, took two years to finish and cost £75,000. It weighs over three tonnes and needs over 100 kilograms of coal and 500 gallons of water to power it. In recognition of John's 30 years service on the railway, Lord Bath decided to name the new engine in his honour. Rather proud to have an engine named after yourself. I'm sure there are people here at Longleat who've done uh, equally as much work uh, in their own departments, but they haven't anything to name other than a bush or a tree or something like that. And, uh, but this, we're, uh, the, or at least the steam engine, will uh, we'll operate for many, many years. It'll, it'll be here 50, 60 years or probably more. Resplendent with brass and shiny paintwork, the new engine is ready for work. <laughs> Boiler, 150 pound per square inch, quite a meaty boiler. It's an 062 tank engine. Um, and of course, me, my name. It's a rare honor, isn't it? Not many people get things named after themselves. Um, of course, uh, I've told the chaps that uh, every morning that's got to be polished when they come in and uh, slight bow, I don't want to low bow, just a slight bow towards it and, and everything will be all right, I'm sure. The inaugural run is scheduled for tomorrow and naturally Lord Bath will be the guest of honour. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the first trip and see uh, how it works and uh, how much of a bark it makes at the chimney. That'll be interesting. Uh, it should be a happy moment. I'm just outside Monkey Jungle and I've rejoined keeper Julie Scott, who earlier on was left with a camera to film the monkeys in secret. Now, we've also been joined by Deputy Head Warden Ian Turner. And Julie, you've got some pretty good footage here, haven't you? That we're going to watch and hopefully see the monkeys at play. So, press play, it will just start in a minute there. So, did you get some good stuff? Were you pleased with what, you, did, yeah. what you filmed? Yeah. And just remind me how many monkeys there are here in, in Monkey Jungle? We've got roughly about 80 adult monkeys plus lots of babies. Monkeys. Right. In fact, there, there are lots of them all kind of wandering around there. So they're not too scared of you, I suppose, because you spend so much time yeah, within the enclosure. Mm. That's excellent. They are amazing looking they things. Are. Do you ever tire of, of, no. um, of no. sitting no there way. watching them? Is there anything that they've ever done in particular that you've just gone, oh my gosh, I can't believe you're doing that? I mean, is when it they're true? wrecking the cars. When they're wrecking the cars, yeah. yes. And look at them here with the water buffalo. Is that one, is that one doing what I think it's doing? It's, it's climbing up its tail? Yeah. I mean, listen, the buffalo don't see the mind. I said the only time they do get a bit stressy is if they start climbing on the face. And then the buffalo get I mean, bit. there's quite a lot of monkeys yeah. up on that buffalo as well. You can, and you can see that the monkeys are relaxed, look, because they, they start to groom each other. Mm -hmm. which obviously is a sign of, like, you know, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Yeah. It's all interaction what the monkeys do with each other. Right. And you can see by sitting on the buffalo that we like that one, look. Yeah. He's, he's got his arms in front of his head. He's sort, of lying, down. he's sort of lying down, like, just really chilling cool, out. Yeah. <laughs> just amazing, well, isn't it? Yeah. They are incredible. And obviously, in the wild, um, water buffalo and recent summer cats come from the same sort of region, yeah. don't they? Is that Asia, is that right? That's right, yeah. And, um, but would, the, would this sort of interaction I go would, on in the wild? I wouldn't think you'd get this in the wild. I think the buffaloes would just run off. Um, and you can see that there, they're so relaxed. 
So, Ian, is there a very strict sort of hierarchy within um, the monkeys that live here? Yeah, I mean, you've got your dominant male, mm -hmm. which is Timothy now, and he's in charge of the whole lot. Mm -hmm. And then you've got, it's usually females are the next one, mm -hmm. the older females, and it works right down to the little babies. And that's how you'll see the grooming will take place. Mm -hmm. You don't see Timothy that much grooming the other ones, but you'll have the females will groom Timothy. Groom and then you'll get the higher females together will groom each other, and then you'll have baby ones will be grooming other baby ones, right. so it all works down in a structure. And that keeps everybody happy, right. you who's in charge, and you get to a certain stage where young males are trying to step up the ladder a little bit, and then get a little bit and of that fights. changes the equilibrium yeah. that they, they've got settled in there. Oh, it's a social thing, if you're, you know, scratching my back, you're scratching yours, if you do something for somebody and you're doing a nice thing by grooming them, it's a sign of being friendly, and that's how it works. They'll actually groom the buffalo. You'll see them in the... And what are they doing, through. just picking up little... Bits of, it's just bits of dry skin, really. Right. It's not fleas or anything like that. And that's the grooming of the buffalo. And that's a sense of, like, you know, where everybody's relaxed, it's calm. There's no hassle here, there's no fighting. Mm -hmm. It's everybody's fine. Well, that is absolutely brilliant. Julie, thank you very much for filming this yeah. amazing footage for us. And, Ian, thank you for, right. for watching it with us. Yeah. <laughs> Earlier on, we spread scent and spices around the tiger enclosure as an enrichment activity and asked keeper Bob Trollope to film how they reacted during the rest of the day. Okay, good. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> we see them here completely ignoring some of it, turning their noses up at other bits, and, well, sometimes the less said, the better. I'm here in Pet's Corner with keeper Sarah Clayson and some of its most popular residents, the ferrets. Sarah, can I, can I pick this one up? Who yeah, do we have in yeah, here? Yeah, that's Bobkin, that one. Bobkin. I'm yeah. amazed that you can tell them all apart. Hello, Bobkin. <laughs> now, they've got these extraordinary sort of long, very bendy, agile bodies, don't they? Is there a reason yeah. for that? Well, originally they're descended from the polecat in the wild and um, they live in burrows, so they have kind of like a bendy body to get down in the burrows and and that's basically the reason why. And when you say originally, what about now? What, what, what's their lifestyle now? Are they, are they domesticated? Ferrets are just domesticated, yeah. It's the, you still get the polecat, the European polecat in the wilds, but um, they were taken out of the wilds 2,000 years ago, roughly, and tamed for rat catching and pets, and that's what a ferret is, a domesticated polecat. And do you think they make good pets? Um, I think they do if you have a lot of time for them and enough space and it's nice if you can have two because as you can see they like living in a large group and they love playing with each other as well. So. Well I bet they are incredibly popular with all the visitors here unless <laughs> they try and bite your hand like that. <laughs> <laughs> well in the meantime here's what's still to come on today's programme. Please don't try and bite me. You're supposed to be a very sweet little creature. They're camouflaged from horn to hoof, so you may not see bongos in Africa, but you will in Wiltshire. There are steamy scenes with Lord Bath as the new engine shows off its pulling power. And Lindy, the sea lion with the sore mouth, needs urgent medical attention, but it's very dangerous for the vet. But first, we need to get back to those collapsing ceilings in the great house. With thousands of visitors pounding the floors above them every day, house steward Ken Winders has noticed that some of them are starting to crack. I remember vividly in the army where, where you had to break step if you were marching over a bridge because the, the, the uh, bridge could, could have broken because of the, uh, the soldiers actually marching um, in step. Of course, you can't stop people, you can't, or at least you can't march them through the house, but where you've got this incessant footfall and of course you get vibration and you set, you set up this sort of uh, movement. So now we have the lower dining room. This used to be the family dining room. A magnificent ceiling uh, which is again 22 karat gold leaf. You can see its reflection in the beautiful 
uh, George III mirrors either end of the, the lower room. dining room is a fine example of the Renaissance Italianate ceilings, which were added by the fourth Marquis in the late 1800s. This is one of the ceilings that we've got problems with. As you can see, it's a very ornate ceiling. Um, and the problems that we've had is the, the, some of the uh, uh, decoration has actually fallen from the ceiling, landed on the floor. Um, and one or two of the randals are, are loose. Um, so I do need to get the experts in to check it out and all of it out. Obviously, we need it to be safe for people to walk through. And we want to catch it before it actually falls down because we don't want to have to replace it. If it hits the deck um, and smashes, then obviously you've got no chance of replacing it. Whereas if we can get it before it falls, um, and th then it's sort of re, re stuck on there, however they, they stick it back on, um, at least it's saved as well as anything else. Martin Watchurst is a specialist ceiling restorer who personally worked on Windsor Castle State Dining Rooms after the fire there in 1992. He's been called in to do a structural survey which should reveal whether the whole thing is about to fall down. By the end of the day we'll be able to work out whether there are more missing pieces or whether there's a problem. In order to find out how badly damaged the ceiling is, Martin looks inside it using a boroscope. We've just found discrete places to make an 8mm hole to pass the tube through. It's, it's basically an illuminated periscope so that we can see inside and safely say we know how this is put together and that things aren't coming apart or separating. If the 150-year-old priceless ceiling were to collapse, it would be a loss to the nation as well as to Longleat. We've got to control it. We've got to do something with it to, to let our grandchildren and their children enjoy it. We'll come back to hear the results of the survey and what urgent repairs may need to be carried out. The latest arrivals in the safari park are three antelopes from Central Africa, called bongos. And now they're out and about in the woods, keeper Tim Yeo has brought me up to get a really good look at them. Aren't they magnificent? They're wonderful, Kate, aren't they? They really are. Just beautiful. Absolutely beautiful animals. It's their markings which are so spectacular and so unusual, aren't they? Yes, yes, quite. Quite. These, th these markings, uh, I'm sure, absolutely sure benefit them greatly in the in the habitat that they come from they come from central east africa these are eastern race bongo right um and uh, they they prefer very thick forest at quite high altitude i think they go up to around 4000 feet wow. uh, above sea level there so uh, very rare to see them the yeah. really wild bongo but beautifully distinctive out here I mean, they're just wonderful and the first thing you notice after looking at the markings is just yeah. how big their ears are again yes these colossal ears they're aren't they extraordinary really. aren't they like sort of For, huge satellite yeah, dishes qu quite i mean very sensitive hearing they would yeah. have to pick up every little noise yeah and so for you, I mean, this is a totally new species for you yes, here very at Longleat. Much, yes. um, how are you going to treat them? Will you treat them very similarly to other antelope and the deer? Certainly we will be, yes. I mean, we've, we've kept eland here for, for many years. And really, at the moment, uh, we are going along those sort of lines. Yeah. But I have to say that while they've been here, um, and particularly while we've had them out in the park here, they've been teaching me a lot. And they're, they're, the way in which they move, I'm already seeing very different ways in which they'll, they'll move uh, to the eland, for instance. Right. And how do they seem to be reacting? I mean, we've got an aeroplane going overhead now. Yes. They don't seem to be too bothered by noise. What about um, having cars? and things going past with visitors. I mean, does that seem to be bothering them? It certainly doesn't, although you perhaps think that they would. Yeah. Um, I think it's when, it's when if perhaps if they're in a certain situation, if they feel that they're hemmed in a bit and, and a car stops, then I think that, that that's when it, it may spook them a bit yeah. and, they'll, and they'll run away from the road a yeah. bit. It's just lovely to see them. And they all seem to get on well with each other as well. They're sort of sticking together, so you get three for the price of one, if you like. 
Yes, yes, brilliant. You haven't got one going it's right going away off from and, the and hiding in the bush. Well, Tim, it's lovely to get a really good look at them. And, I, well, I look forward to sneaking down occasionally and getting another peek because they're just great. Thank you very much indeed. Not at all. Today is a big day down at Longleat Central with the first run for the new steam engine. John Hayton has been running the railway for over 30 years and, in recognition of this, Lord Bath has decided to name the engine after him. The press have turned out in force to witness the big occasion. How am I feeling today? Well, a strange feeling, actually. Uh, 30 years has suddenly gone by and here we are. The railway has always been a family affair for the Haytons. John's wife, Anne, works in the shop, and son Andy, who's head keeper at the Giraffery, has been involved with the train since he was a kid. Although his dad, John, is actually old enough to retire, Andy knows that he isn't going anywhere. I think they'll have to shoot dad to get rid of him from here. Uh, he's one of those people that he's always got to be doing something. Um, and I think if he retires, he'll just... It'd just be a pain in the butt for Mum, really, I think. It's best, best we keep it working. The problem is that John has a one-track mind. Railways have been a passion, really, rather than, than work. It's, uh, I mean, I travel all around the world going on trains. You know, I've mean, been across America, been across Russia, China, um, riding on trains. What could be possibly better than to ride in a train? Nothing, is there? I mean, it's just nothing. I mean, there's life there. We've given that life this morning. With one match, we've made that live. The new engine is fired up and ready to go. But there's still time for a quick cuppa and a few photos before the guest of honour arrives. John, hello. Oh, good morning, my lord. Well, you've got the train in very fine order. Oh, and there's a sign. Do you like good. it? Yes. Sir John Hayton. Wasn't wonderful, isn't it? It's Thank well deserved. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. With Lord Bath on board, it's time to set the wheels in motion. Other things like the boats I've named after my wife or my children, but the most deserving person for actually having started it all up is John Hayton. So it was time we had the John Hayton rolling along. first run could not have been smoother. Oh, I'm going to be recommending it to all my under twos, under fives. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Yeah, wonderful. It's been, yeah, it, it, it'll do the job. Wonderful. <laughs> Superb. The, the, the one that it replaced, was it in a bad way? No, it's too small. Uh -huh. it, it wasn't uh, big enough for the yeah. job. We've got, we've, well, now no. that we get many, many more people coming, we need many more carriages on. Yeah. So therefore we need a stronger engine. Yeah. Wonderful idea. Simple as that. Well, that's it, the first one, the first trip. Great, yes, everything moves that should move. Um, oh, this'll do the job all right. Sounded nice. Uh, it should even be better with the full load on going up the hill. Yeah, great. Just need a drink now. Orange juice, of course. Whether you're talking about the man or the engine, it doesn't look as though John Hayton will be running out of steam for a good while yet. Right by the railway line at Pets Corner, there's a new exhibit with some adorable little wallabies. There are lots of these bouncy creatures up in Wallaby Wood, of course, but keeper Bev Allen says that these are quite different and will be kept separate. 
These are actually palmer wallabies, a different right. kind of species of wallabies. Um, they're the Bennett's wallabies up at the top. Right. Um, they're a lot bigger. These are only 50 centimetres tall, fully grown, of course. So these are fully grown? Fully grown. They won't get any bigger than oh, this. Oh, they're <laughs> mini wallabies. They are adorable. And uh, have you got a male and female here? Yeah, we've got a male and a female. This is the female that's uh, more confident and actually eating. Right. The male's still a little bit nervous because they've only been out for two days now. Right. So he's still settling in. And of course, the train's going by, so it's different noises and sounds and things like that. Now, you've hand reared a wallaby before. A wallaby is one of your sort of favourites. Oh, I do like wallabies, kangaroos, any marsupial animal. I actually really do like. Um, I'm really into them, and I'm really glad we've got them in Pets Corner, so I'm really happy. <laughs> <laughs> and with a pair, are you hoping that you may start a small breeding colony uh, here? I think they will eventually, yes. Um, he's been trying his luck with her already. Oh, so, has he? Yeah, I, I'm hoping for a few um, little joeys, so it'll be brilliant. Yeah. That would be absolutely amazing. And, I mean, with this settling down process, does it take quite a long time? I mean, what are the signs that will tell you that they're looking kind of settled and <laughs> we love being at Pets Corner? Yeah, well, if you look at her, she's actually quite calm. Um, yeah. And she actually has been sort of venturing over around the enclosure and um, just sat there. He's a little bit nervous. I think it's where the train's gone by. He's going to take a little bit longer to settle in because he is older. He's three years old. Right. Um, she's only a year and a half, so where she's probably a bit younger, she's probably you know a bit used to this. A little, you know. little kiss on the ear there. I, I think they'll both be fine. It'll probably take a couple of weeks or so, and then once they settle, then they'll, they'll be OK. We can hear a train coming. Let's see how he seems to react to it. Not too bothered. No, he's, uh, I mean, he's like following it now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> train spotting yeah, wallaby. Yeah, train spotting. Um, but it's good that he isn't actually rolling um, really fast into fences and things. Yes. Um, this is what we expected anyway. Um, but hopefully in a couple of weeks, like I say, he will settle down. They'll be sat down together in the sunshine. So, oh, that'll yeah. be great. Yeah. And, I mean, with things like feeding and care, is it very similar to the bigger wallabies or do they need anything special? Basically, it's all the same. Right. Because um, in the wild, they eat um, lots of grasses. So we, we've got grass in the pen, also we give them hay. Yeah. Um, also different fruits and veg as well. We feed them, they eat leaves, um, barks and roots of the trees and things. So it's about the same, yeah. Well, it's great to see them, Bev. They are a really lovely addition to okay. Pets Corner. And, of course, we will keep you posted with the wallabies' progress. And, oh, I know what I forgot to ask. What are they called? Oh, they haven't actually got names at the moment. We are actually doing a competition, so we are oh, looking really? for names, get the, the public to um, name them. So. OK, well, that's what we'll do. We will let you know as soon as these two wallabies have names and, of course, how they get on here at Pets Corner. Bev, thank you very much indeed. Yeah. Oh. Earlier on, the keepers down at Half Mile Lake were very worried about one of the sea lions. Lindy's had a sore mouth for over a month now. She isn't eating, and Safari Park vet Duncan Williams can see that changing her diet and giving her antibiotics have made no difference. The last time I saw her about a week ago out here, I think she's lost weight since then as well, so I think she's going downhill, and I think she's probably starting to suffer. The only chance of helping Lindy now is for Deputy Head Warden Ian Turner to sedate her so that Duncan can give her a proper examination. It's dangerous because it may cause her breathing difficulties and it's very difficult to judge the right amount of anaesthetic for a sea lion. They just fight all the time and it's all the blubber. If it's not going in properly, you've got to give it time to wait. I say, luckily, now that Doug can actually inject, he knows exactly where it's going. You just got to pace. I say, if it wasn't working on the mouth, we'd be fine. We could jump on her now and grab her, but we've got to open up her jaw. And, and Doug has got to look inside. He'll end up losing all his fingers. Duncan tops up the anaesthetic, and hopefully Lindy won't bite him now while he examines her. It isn't good news. Look, she's lost all these teeth here. Yeah. They've all just disappeared. I mean, whether it's a bone tumor or something, that's all swollen out there and there. And that's hard palate that's exposed there. That must be so yeah. All the teeth behind the canine, the sort of premolar teeth, they've all disappeared where the jaw has just kind of disappeared. 
and, and it's very thick and all the way around, but you know, with the, um, the tumour. So if she was to survive this now, uh, uh, the canines, actually all the bone holding the canine ends disappeared as well, so that would be the next step. She'd lose, lose that canine as well. So I don't really think we've got much, you know, much option. I think what we're going to do is put her to sleep just now. It was cancer. The tumour had eaten away the bone of Lindy's jaw and there was no possibility of repairing the damage. It was even worse than we thought, because one of the canines was completely bare and all the teeth at one side was gone, so she must have been in such pain. There's not really any therapy we could do for that at all. I think um, even if it was something like a, a pet dog or something like that, but we could see him in surgery and treat with injections regularly, I don't really think there'd be much that we could have done for, you know, a massive... Um, Loss of bone like that there now. Head of Lake Animals, Mark Tai, was away the week that Lindy died. It was a difficult decision to have to make, but it's one of those things working with animals, you know, you, you have to make these decisions sometimes. You've got to think of the quality of life for the animal. And obviously, if she was in great pain, and the fact that she couldn't now eat because of the injuries in her mouth. You've got to draw the line somewhere, and it is a difficult thing to do, but it has to be done sometimes, and that's part and parcel of working with animals, you know. It's not all sort of rose-coloured, tinted spectacles, you know. You, there is a reality to it, and the reality is sometimes animals don't make it. It was sea lion I personally knew since she was two years old. Um, so to see her sort of grow up, you know, bring up her own offspring, things like that. And she was a big character in the lake, you know. She was one of those sea lions that was very in your face, very well known. So, yeah, big shame. The unique gold leaf ceiling in the lower dining room is in danger of collapsing because of the unending tramp of visitors' feet through the room above. We do need to be aware of the amount of people that's coming through at any one time. Um, because, it, you know, if we were going to have this, as I say, two, three, three, three and a half thousand people through per day, um, then it's on its way. You know, so we need, do need to be to be aware of that and to try and handle the situation. You could have anything, especially in the, in the room above, you could have anything, anything up to 200 people in there at any one time, which is the problem. Fortunately, the experts have been brought in just in time. You would expect a number of cracks in a ceiling of this age, but hopefully, from the look of the first, um, access point we made into the ceiling, it should turn out to be a nice, solid, sound ceiling. The survey by Martin Watchhurst revealed that the ceiling is basically sound, but should be monitored for signs of stress. Luckily, it was possible to replace the bits that had fallen off. The ceiling has been here since the great days of the British Empire and provides a real sense of history, which both Ken and Lady Bath are keen to preserve. So this is the one here, is it? That's it, Lady that, That's the area. one here yeah. that has been repaired and you, frankly, would not know a thing, would you? No, no difference at all. He's a good craftsman, isn't he? He certainly is. It's heartwarming, yes, when, because none of these craftsmen are cheap, obviously. But it's lovely to see that they do a good job. It was a one-man band, actually, doing the plaster and the gilding. And he's done a darn good job of it. And it's nice to know that there are still people able to do that sort of thing, you see. Well, it's the crux of the matter. It's the heart of the battle, isn't it? It's the main thing, really, isn't it? With a house that is 400 and some years old, that's the main battle, to preserve it. That's what we, my husband and myself, we try to do. We try to hand over something to my son 
that's coherent and in good state, then it's his pigeon afterwards, you see. But at least we would have done our best, very best, and our duty to the house, to the family. That's what it's all about. While Mark Tai will undoubtedly miss Lindy, he'll have plenty to keep him busy. As well as the sea lions, he also looks after the two hippos who live in the lake, Nico and Samba on Gorilla Island, and two flocks of pelicans. As if that wasn't enough, Mark's also in charge of the giant aviary. We've got Chilean flamingos, uh, African spoonbills, and sacred ibis, and various small types of duck as well. They're, they, they look so spectacular all together. Do they all get on? Yeah, they get on very well. Yeah, we don't have any problems with them. And obviously it's a big enough area that they can flap their wings and fly around in. Yes, that's the whole point of having it such, such a large size so they can actually get up and fly around. It's quite good to see when they do. So it's a, a, a sort of as a natural environment as they can have in captivity. Yeah, absolutely. It's really good for them to be able to get out and exercise. Yeah, can I just ask you one thing? <laughs> mm. I know you're a very busy man. <laughs> How have you had time to make mud pies <laughs> in this enclosure? <laughs> What's going on over there? Just childhood thing of an afternoon. <laughs> um, no, these what we decided. We wanted to turn this area into a mud flat that we'd hoped that the flamingos would use for breeding. Right. And we sort of gave them a bit of a head start and built some nest cones for them. <laughs> so just what, to see what, if they... what would they build? That, would they nest directly onto those? Yes, they, they would build these mud cones themselves. Right. And they stand and tread the mud up and down and then make it soft and then build up a little tower. Right. And there's a small dish in the top and they lay a and single, they put the eggs up in the single egg in the top. And yeah. is that to keep the eggs um, safe from predators? And, and... Yes, and also if the water level fluctuates, it's going to be safe. And also because they've got such long legs, it's easier for them to sit down yes, without legs up around their ears. <laughs> like a chair, yeah. a flamingo chair. <laughs> That's it. And would they use any other sort of bedding or would they put the egg straight onto the mud? No, it would be straight onto the mud. They'd, they'd say there'd be a small dish in the top to stop yeah. it rolling out and it would just be there. That's and we have, to, we have to ask, any eggs yet? No, they're all too young at the moment. We're hoping maybe next year would be a good start. Great. OK. Fingers well, crossed. We will, indeed. Keep us posted, Mark. Yeah. Thank you very much. Sadly, that's all we've got time for on today's programme, but here's what's coming up on the next Animal Park. Will mother or baby survive when a marmoset mum undergoes a caesarean section? The new boy is keen to join the safari boat crew, but will he be an able seaman? And you've got to understand that apart from all the, the risks of driving a boat, you know, the breaking down, the running the ground, the keeping it in a straight line, there are animal dangers. And film from the early days of the safari park, including a demonstration of why you shouldn't get out of your car. It did rather show people what could possibly happen and then would make them think twice. We'll have all that and more on the next Animal Park. <laughs>